I'm Lisa Grace, and I am here in Oakland, California, and speaking with Rahasia, who is on the mountaintop in the Karoo in South Africa. And we are coming together to chat today because we're going to be facilitating the, the Desire, Fear, and Taboo course that starts September 5th with the Shakti Shiva Academy. So we've done a little bit of rounding up of concepts today to, to talk about what can really help support this space that we're creating of inviting people into this depth of work. Um, talking about polarities and projections and the, the victim, predator, savior triangle and throwing lots of terms out there that we're gonna be delving into in the course. But there's also something just about creating the invitation, creating the space. And so I wanna open up the conversation with Rahasia and you can say a little bit about yourself uh, just to, to talk about us coming together to hold the space of this work. Well, um, yeah, Lisa, thanks for introducing me there. Yes, uh, from South Africa and um, yeah, indeed, I put a mountain um, in yeah, the Karoo Desert. And uh, it's sweet to be invited to uh, teach this part of this course, this module, with you especially, uh, Lisa. Long time since I've seen you in the flesh, and nice to be working with you now on the virtual. Why not? I'm already appreciating here the the polarities that we hold. That I'm in California, you're up in the hills in South Africa, and. Uh, we're just bringing together quite a vast array of influences and part of the reason that I love teaching for the academy and teaching this course particularly because it brings in a lot of new people to the work is that it tracks people from around the world so it brings in different cultures and that's so helpful for actually starting to peek out of our conditioning to be able to see not only here are people around the world who are in the same kind of inquiry and the same kind of challenge, the same kind of contorting into what does it mean to belong? What does it mean to fit into society? And how that has been so unconsciously shaped by our surroundings, by our location, by our family, by our friend groups, all of it. So I love that you and I are getting to hold such vastly different contexts and backgrounds and coming together for this course. Yeah, nice to have that, that reach because being here in South Africa, one thing I've always delighted in with this place is it's halfway between East and West on the old trade routes. And so even though there was really government level missions to keep groups of people apart, it was called apartheid. Um, even though there was that, there were people here from the East, there's, there's communities from India going back hundreds of years, just as much as the Christian churches and so on. So, how to say, you, you can walk around one suburb in South Africa and encounter people from all over the planet, essentially, or, you know, that have origins from all over the planet. And now... It's, it's really... Easy. I know I, I'm in a bubble in a bubble in a bubble, essentially in the Bay Area, in California, in the United States of its and and also in um, sex positive community such. So I'm very in this particular mindset and group and vocabulary. And it's so easy to forget what is conditioning and what is part of ourselves of like of being in the, the burning question of what is actually me and what has, what have I been conditioned because of survival? I mean, it gets that extreme, right? When we're talking about identity and personality uh, and needing to fit in. So it's, it's, it's stepping into a container like this is so helpful for starting to see that more clearly and see outside of what we take for granted as the self. Yeah, and that's a nice polarity too, because there where you are in Oakland, California, you're kind of 
that that's really where the bleeding edge of this exploration of humanity has happened. You're right on the front of it. And the, the whole intriguing question around identity, if you look, it's really the start of the question of who am I, what am I? You know, it's not the answer to the question, but it's the start of the question, which is a very good thing for that to now be reaching into the culture. You know? mm. it's, 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 how to say, that hasn't been a question for most of humanity, for most of humanity's existence. Now it's a question. So good. Yes, and I, I think that's really important also to hold just the act of being in the question rather than it being a focus on an answer. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You, were, you were speaking earlier to the nature of seeking. Well, in the, in the nature of seeking, and almost at any level of it, or certainly at the level of, uh, hmm, I think I'm going to have to expand vocabulary, but um, awakening is the objective of many teachings, including this particular one we're working with. Awakening is the point at which one's interest in some aspect of this ritual becomes more than a hobby. Hmm? which starts to matter where it matters. You could say awakenings where truth truth matters more than anything. And the encouragement towards that, or the, um, how to say, supporting with the steps, giving warnings of the known um, things that happen. This is the beauty of archetypes, that they can give you a pretty good idea of what's going to be happening. Ah, so, yes, archetypes. No, you're going to be individuating from family and culture. You're going to be individuating from that if this goes well. So <laughs> then the whole shakeup of what am I and who am I becomes a much deeper question than it is for culture. The culture's got its argument about it and its discussions about it and so on, but and it, it kind of looks deep, but compared to the individual journey to individualization, it's shallow. Uh-huh. Um, of, of, of taking honest ritual teaching, even just joining a group for some online work like we're doing, that intent, that moving into a practice doesn't even have to be something that's eventually going to be your practice. It's just the opening to okay. and putting yourself to that sort of exposure to scary notions like the one I just said. I mean, who wants to individuate from their family? I love my family. I don't want to individuate from them. But but no, you know, I had to once upon a time. And some, ways of something that comes up frequently in talking with people is the discomfort of conforming, that there becomes a an illusion that everybody else is doing that just fine. Everybody else is doing it right. And uh-huh then the individual frequently has the impression of I'm so uncomfortable something is wrong with me because I'm awkward I'm uncomfortable everybody else is doing it right somehow and the realization that some people are just more natural conformers than others and it is more comfortable for them but ultimately everybody is in this same kind of discomfort deep down of the yearning to be an actualized being. Uh, yeah, that, 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 that impression of what others believe is such a tricky area. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's uh, one, I mean, I'll share this with you. My favorite example of it was something that just gave me a lot of, you could say, mental relief around that whole area. Mm-hmm. Was uh, a psychologist, um, R.D. Lang, I think it was. I'm pretty sure it was him. R.D. Lang, very clever psychologist in the early days before psychology became, you know, psychology, you know, back when it was about exploring the human condition, the psyche, and so on. And R.D. Lang um, did a little survey. Uh, he went down a street in England, and this was in the 60s. And a lot of people were coming to England, you know, people from empire, 
that had been given citizenship or something, some were coming to England. So there were colored people arriving in England. And what he did was he went down the street and he did a survey at every house. He asked the same question. If one of these colored chappies coming over now wanted to rent your spare room, if you had a spare room, would you rent it to the colored border? It's called the colored border problem. And at every house, you got exactly the same answer. Me, I'd love to. I'm interested in new people. I'd love to hang out with some fellow from Africa or India or from Jamaica or from wherever else the inquiry comes from. It'd be wonderful. But I wouldn't, uh, no, I wouldn't rent in the room. Can't. Why not? Because my the neighbors are a bunch of racist swine, basically. Uh -huh. The neighborhood wouldn't, uh, I, I, on account of the neighborhood, I couldn't do it. But at every house, he got that answer. Wow. Yeah. So that... when you see mass compliance in humanity, it's not a cause for depression. I used to get quite a, you know, it's not, it's not that they believe. It's that they believe the others believe. Right. The upholding. That's... That's... <laughs> they all believe the others believe. None of them believe it. Not one racist to the entire street. But everyone knows the street is racist. Hmm. Yeah, just just the upholding, the dance of the collective in that. Yeah. And yeah. without the full ownership of the individual, with without being able to face this is what I think. That's it's that's a great example of the way that gets just dispersed into the collective. And also just what it did for me was confronting my notion of where I seem to be thinking different from others to realize, you know, <laughs> right. I think everybody thinks that way. Mm. Oh. Yeah. So, so where does real change come from? Ah, oh, ah. Oh. It, it moves so beautifully. I mean, I've been watching, you could say, that the middle of the culture as expressed by, say, mainstream evening interview programs like Oprah's stuff. I don't know if she still does. But Oprah mm -hmm. used to have a program. Uh, do people still know who Oprah is? Is the name oh, familiar? Sure. She's epic. But I don't think oh. she has her program. I don't even know. Right. But now, if you look at, say, the language that Oprah commonly uses and Dr. Phil commonly uses, which is the language of um, a training which is now really called Landmark, you know, Werner Erhardt and Est and all that, they were graduates of that work. And their lives are deeply symptomatic of it. You know, really, they really showed up. And that's, that's their whole personal power trip, really, rather than they train out of that particular training. So are you saying that those programs actually supported real change? Oh, 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 yes, yes. Because by the, now, now in the 70s, Verna was very undercover underground. The guy that I was taking a similar variation of, of, of that kind of mind training school over here in South Africa, man, uh, he was, he was spent a, a chunk of his life in the court, had a heart attack from the pressure of that and so on. You know, it was radically anti-cultural I mean the, well, it wasn't radically anti-cultural but the culture sort is anti-cultural the culture sort is right the culture sort is disturbing you couldn't talk the kind of language that Oprah and Dr. Phil talk on TV in the 70s you couldn't just just the basic sort of uh, concept and framework that with which they addressed the mind you couldn't talk that language in the 70s you'd be a complete cook so completely it was it was not received kindly by the system, but what is it you by saw? 90s, it was normal. What is it that you saw being really effective in those programs that actually was touching people or touching the root? The, the core kind of notions, I mean, the one thing that came through quite a bit is the stuff, there's a lot of stuff around self-responsibility. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Phil got on about that even relates to things like what Tony Robbins teaches and so on. 
and even Jordan Peterson these days, I suppose, there's some attitude of the self-responsibility thing. Yes. Okay. So that's a great transition, bringing in somebody as inflammatory as Jordan Peterson. That it's, yeah, but let's talk about this. This we brought in about, you know, a couple of those programs were quite controversial because it became focused on the figurehead of that program. And so we were talking a little earlier about this intersection of archetype and teacher and inner work and what can become weaponized from any point, from the learnings offered to the students, the students can go and weaponize particular concepts or the, the figurehead can start abusing their power. You know, there's, so this is a very rich topic that I'm actually glad to address when inviting people into possibly a very new practice of uh, that requires deep trust and and actually the way i see it requires or it, it does require quite a bit of personal compass personal awareness and getting to that point of, of being able to use the sniff test about truth and about what is landing for humans so i just tossed a lot your way so do you have anything about about this topic of archetypes and teachers and trustability. Yeah. Um, well, first off is every teacher that I consider worthwhile, including very strongly the Buddha, um, have a, a characteristic pretty much universally in common that I that, that's for me a nice touch point of discernment is they will tell you directly. Like uh, the way my master put it beautifully, he said, maybe you will take my suggestions, work with the methods I give you, believe what I tell you and so on, because, you know, I'm your guru uh, and you ascribe me that certain authority. And so we're going to roll with it. And then you will suffer. Don't do that. Take everything I give you on the basis of you taste it. You try it out for yourself. Mm -hmm. you know, dip your toe. See how it feels. Mm -hmm. Explore it. You find some aspect that it doesn't seem to suit you. Playing with making it your own. See what can suit you. And you know? how about this balance of of facilitating, of holding a space for people to be stepping into with some some measure of of depth and reliability and and I hesitate to use the word safety um, of just creating a welcoming, brave space for people to be in exploration um, that is also holding this balance of not just being a projection archetype but also serving the space. Yeah, like, like so safety, for example. I mean, one beautiful addressing of that I've heard from a teacher. I'm not, I'm not that's why I'm saying I have heard. I'm not necessarily endorsing this. The, uh, okay, sorry. The, 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 the teacher was about to die, and uh, he set himself up with one of his students. They put together with a very special meditation, the two of them long and hard until they were that they were pretty good sure the student could certainly challenge the master after he uh, channel the master after he died mm -hmm. then the master died and the student channeled him and he had two things to say about death. he said first of all it's like taking off an old pair of shoes and the second thing he said and this is most important the second thing it is completely safe so some teacher will maybe use that notion that existence holds you. I mean, listen to Jesus, listen to any of them. Mm. They say existence holds you. Existence. Don't, feel I don't, I don't feel supported. No, no. Existence holds you. 
Maybe it holds you into your death two years from now from something painful. Maybe it holds you into that. Maybe that's the experiencing of your life. But so existence holds. What's coming up for me there? Because I love that existence holds you. Such a, a vast and beautiful aligned invitation. And for people who are just starting to navigate such deep trust of themselves, um, I think it may be easier to project onto somebody else, you're holding existence for me, or sure. you're, you're holding structure. Yeah. Yeah, the archetype has that. Sometimes your teachers will be people you want to be. Sometimes your teachers will be people you're terrified of becoming. <laughs> you wouldn't know anything about that one, would you? Oh, I've had woman after woman say to me, I am so scared. I don't want to be like Shakti, or I don't want to be like Wendy, or I don't want to be like Akira, or I don't want to be like Valentina. Yeah. And to every one of them, yes, I know exactly what you mean. But the good news and the bad news. The, the bad news is you're going to be like that. But the good news is you won't be like Shakti in the way that Valentina is not like Shakti. And you won't be like Valentina in the way that Wendy's not like Valentina. Mm. So what? But yeah. the characteristic that's scaring you is these are women of power and your power is coming on. Yeah, that's the bad news. You're going to have that. Because the ultimate invitation is about, again, back to self and for whatever that means, however that is aligning in, in resource, truth, being. It's stepping away of the illusions and I hate to say this, this is going to be very unpopular in the world these days, but in a way, but your identities. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 the archetype of seeking and, and where the archetype holds you, when I say existence holds you, uh, here's a, a symptom or two you can look for in your life, anyone can look for to see, you know, has existence given me that, is if you're listening to people like me, at least uh, on account of a curiosity around this kind of stuff, and at some point you've been moved by a question on the level of, I want to know the truth of love, or I want to know what existence really is, or I want to know what my purpose in life is, or any of those, you could say, really big questions. Mm -hmm. Archetypally, such a big question is the start of your true seeking. And then archetypally, back in the day, you know, archetype is formed by other lives. So the Buddha put a, a great of effort into quite effort into when people came to him at that point of their journey of immediately sending them away for a couple of lessons one of those lessons was the lesson of travel and he'd say go travel three days and stop and don't stay somewhere longer than three days and move on move three days with each time and if you think of if you were off on foot and traveled like that it's a few days and you're in a different culture people are starting to talk about different People do things different ways. They cook with different spices, and so on and so on. And there's a whole lot of lessons that you can see um, that, that, that that is supposed to teach one or can teach one. A whole lot of things about the culture I was born in is not necessarily the best and only and most perfect culture. Maybe the, some of the things that I've picked up and the ways I do things are not my way. Maybe they're borrowed. They're not authentically whatever expression of whatever I'm supposed to be on this path, and so on, and get that question going. So if some time ago, not you, Lisa, but uh, anyone going to listen to this, has had those big questions, it's likely that you've gone traveling, or you've had a lot of foreigners move into your neighborhood, or your workspace, or something that you've encountered, different cultures, different attitudes, different ways, and been challenged a little bit to look at your own. To start disassembling what's automatic and what's really me, what's authentic, what's the essential, and what's the not essential. Yeah, because so, it's it's really all about becoming at choice. Of um, people, 
sometimes I have the impression with this work that there is more of an agenda of coming to the the black and white of the right and wrong and the the guilty and the innocent and all, and weeding through to what it means to be a really wonderful being and all, and to me it's there's really a, a return to authenticity and something I I think we we should wrap up soon but something that I want to bring in here is because we've touched on a couple of um potentially spicy topics and part of the name of this course is taboo and in holding this work not just from a personal development level but also a a tantric level Um, and what I hold that to mean is the acceptance of everything and there's just the continuous practice of not excluding and of being with, and eventually in self being with your experience without the preference of needing it to change, needing it to go away, needing it to be different, but of really practicing being with. And so even in this conversation, I'm aware that some some little spicy bits have come in. And so this particular invitation in this work is really in that holding of of welcoming all that is. And so I just want to bring that in to kind of pull this together as such a, an integral part of this invitation. If you want to speak to that. You know, what you bring in there and that practice, um, Shakti's formulation of that, I remember the whole process of this creation it's really beautiful uh, what we're doing there is what ultimate did really beautiful is you take a lesson from tantric which is not tantric practice is not a for everyone thing it's extremely harsh and rapid you know when i talk about you know getting confronted on maybe your way is not the only way the tantra initiation is centered around taboos the taboos of the culture, the important, uh, how to say, it, it, the taboos you take seriously, the mm. things you seriously consider as taboos. You, you, you might think of them as cultural person. Doesn't matter if you take them seriously. That's the stuff that you're going to be hitting in a tantric initiation, and not for everyone to walk straight into that wall. It's a hard wall to smash straight through. <laughs> but. To take a teaching like that from Tantra, it's got all the symptoms of a Tantric teaching, the scariness, the danger, the potential for abuse, wow, wow, it's huge. And then bring a teaching like that across to an exit. What, what we're doing with this is bringing that teaching across in a more, how to say, in, a, in an accessible way that not only the real berserkers who, you know, are Tantra or nothing else kind of thing can relate to and learn from and move with without, um, you know, when I say the tantric path isn't for everyone, who it isn't for is those who will feel revisiting something shocking as a re traumatization as opposed to an opportunity to pass through. Most people, like, uh, uh, in many areas, even if we're a real berserker tantrica, in plenty of areas, it's better for us to, mm, you know, what they call baby steps take things a step at a time and build from there and you can still get the same result even pretty damn quick it mm-hmm. can you can look at the territory that way and go oh, okay this is for me full-on tantric initiation here we go or you can look at it and go okay i see it i see the value i'll take it in bites that i can handle thank you very much mm-hmm. and so just looking at what are the taboos just becoming aware of i hold taboos Hmm. Some of these cultural taboos, I very automatically assume them to be right and correct. How interesting. They might not necessarily be. I wonder what my way would be. And gently probe and question around these things. And And that brings up a, a wonderful theme that recurs over and over in these teachings is the, I should be feeling something different. 
or I should be doing something different. And rather than just being at peace with whatever is, is mm. that an individual system can handle. Yeah, well, also, yes, because that, that also brings us to a joke, which is not always a joke, yes. <laughs> Great. Consists on accepting my current state exactly as I am, as being perfect. Well, fucking, I don't want it. <laughs> yep, that too. <laughs> so it is really powerful, I found, to be doing this in groups. And this course that we're loosely talking about is a seven week course. So it's pretty quick, but it's allowing just enough dipping into these concepts and also there's the forum online so people can be posting their responses and the homework along the way and getting a little normalization and a little just support of going through the process and and helping being reminded of to me the piece that is most powerful most integral is, is the being able to be with ourselves with love, to be with everything that is arising of just taking the triggers, taking everything that's coming up as, oh, there's a piece of me I'm not loving yet. And being able to hold it there. Yeah, the way my teacher put it, and I think this work is very much in the same direction. This work is aiming to enhance your ability to experience. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Ex the ability to experience life, increasing capacity, staying with sensation, staying in the body, staying present. And for all, all that that means, it will be exploring in much more depth. Right. Looking straight into the dark corners we don't like to look at. Mm. I see it as, as lovingly taking a flashlight and shining into the corners and then inviting all of those little critters hiding in there. Let it play peekaboo. <laughs> Okay, let's end it there, even though I could just keep talking with you. There's so many directions to take this work. And I'm truly excited to be holding this space with you. So thank you for joining on this journey. Lovely, so gorgeous to be doing this work with you. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah.